In his letter to the Romans, we learn that the Apostle Paul was accused of lying so that God could get more glory. Paul, not known to mince words, said that anyone who would do such a thing would be justly condemned to hell. For Paul, lying in the name of God was definitely not okay, even if it was for a good cause. But that is precisely what the author of Ephesians and Colossians did, according to critical scholars like Bart Ehrman. In my previous video, I made the positive case for Pauline authorship of the two letters. Be sure to check it out, but in this video, we'll listen to Ehrman just to see how strong the pro-forgery arguments are. There's a number of different reasons that Ehrman gives to argue against the genuineness of these two letters, but I'll focus on the three that he believes are the strongest. So let's go ahead and get started. Here's Ehrman. He writes, The main reason for thinking that Paul didn't write Ephesians is that what the author says in places does not jibe with what Paul says in his own letters. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, for example, certainly looks like Paul's writing, but just on the surface. Here is in all Paul's authentic letters, we learn that believers were separated from God because of sin, but have been made right with God exclusively through God's grace, not the result of works. But here, oddly, Paul includes himself as someone who, before coming to Christ, was carried away by the passions of our flesh, doing the will of the flesh and the senses. This does not sound like the Paul of the undisputed letters letters who says that he had been blameless with respect to the righteousness of the law. I have to say this argument is so underwhelming. Bart seems to simply forget Romans 7 where Paul goes into great detail about his struggles with covetousness. Paul writes, For I know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now if I do the thing that I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So using Bart's logic, we could say that Philippians proves that Romans isn't a genuine letter of Paul. That's strike one for Dr. Ehrman. Let's see what else he's got. Here's Bart again. He writes, One of the reasons he wrote 1 Corinthians was precisely because some of the Christians in that community took the opposing point of view and maintained that they were already enjoying a resurrected existence with Christ now, that they were already enjoying the benefits of salvation. Paul devotes 1 Corinthians 15 to show that this is something that had not happened yet. It is a future physical event yet to occur. Christians have not been raised with Christ. But contrast this with the statement with which Ephesians says, Even when we were dead through our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places. Here believers have experienced a spiritual resurrection and are enjoying a heavenly existence in the here and now. This is precisely the view Paul argued against in his letters to the Corinthians. So does the writer of Ephesians have too much of a realized eschatology in comparison with Paul's other letters like Bart suggests? No, I don't think so. First of all, 1 Corinthians 6.17 says that believers have union with Christ. If Christ is seated in heavenly places, so are those who are one spirit with him. Ephesians 1.22 through 23 is just a continuation of the thought in in Ephesians 2 6. He's talking about the glorious inheritance of the saints, which is that they are members of Christ's body. Logically speaking, where the body of Christ is, so also is the head. In 1 Corinthians 12 12 through 31, Paul goes into great lengths to show the Corinthian believers are members of the body of Christ. So where does that spiritually locate them? Ephesians is simply just examining another facet of the same truth. Furthermore, what Paul writes in Romans 8 30 could equally cause him to be accused of having too much of a realized eschatology, for it says that that believers, presently, are glorified in Christ. But I thought that 1 Corinthians 15 teaches that only after the resurrection are believers glorified. Finally, Paul would seem to teach that believers are not just dead to sin, but also made alive unto God in Romans chapter 6. This means that because of their spiritual resurrection, they can walk in the newness of life and not be bound to sin. And elsewhere in the uncontested letters of Paul, Paul does use triumphant language to describe the believer's position in spite of the struggle they still have in this earthly life. He calls the believers in Rome more than conquerors in Christ, and he tells the Corinthian Christians that they are always caused to triumph in Christ. So that would be strike two for Ehrman, but let's give him one more parting shot. Ehrman writes, The writing style is not Paul's. Paul usually writes in short, pointed sentences. The sentences in Ephesians are long and complex. In Greek, the opening statement of thanksgiving, all 12 verses, is one sentence. There is nothing wrong with extremely long sentences in Greek. It just isn't the way Paul wrote. This style of writing is referred to with the fancy term pleonastic by scholars. That means there's a fullness to it. The sentences are abounding in prepositional phrases, relative clauses, participles, and multiplying synonyms. In response to this very common argument, New Testament scholars D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo write, Once again, however, this difference is somewhat exaggerated. The pleonastic style dominates only the first half of the letter. The style of the second half falls within customary Pauline range. Unless one postulates two authors for the two halves and that is not seriously entertained, we might be wiser to seek an explanation of the peculiar style of the first half in its substance, the style accords with its lofty doxologies, prayers, and sweeping theological themes. When Paul tackles similar themes in his undisputed letters, his style can become similarly florid. Just think of Romans 8, 28 through 39, or Romans 11, 33 through 36. So this seems to be Ehrman making too much over apparent stylistic differences. That's strike three for Bart. Now what about Colossians? Ehrman says that the reasons for thinking the book was not actually written by Paul are much the same written for Ephesians, so I'll go ahead and stop here for now. 
Here's the bottom line. The external evidence for both of these letters is very strong, as is the internal evidence. After examination, Bart's arguments turn out to be very weak. He hasn't given us strong enough reasons to overturn that which was the majority view for centuries. These epistles are not forgeries. Paul wrote Ephesians and Colossians. 